all about honey, monofloral varieties of honey. This presentation is the third in a series of presentations about honey. The first one talks more generally about honey, how it is made and harvested, the different types of honey, how do we assess honey quality, and how do we determine what the botanical origin of that honey is. The second presentation is the sensory analysis of honey, how to taste and appreciate it. And then finally this presentation, I go through and discuss and describe uh, over 80 monofloral varieties of honey. Before I uh, begin my presentation, uh, let's uh, talk about the different types of honey. In general, there's two types, polyfloral, also known as wildflower, and then monofloral, sometimes called unifloral honey. Polyfloral honey is honey that is made from nectar that has been collected from multiple floral sources. Examples might include spring or fall wildflower, desert blossom. Monofloral honey on the other hand, is made from nectar that is collected primarily from a single type of flower. Examples are alfalfa, buckwheat, orange blossom, and so on. So how is monofloral honey created? Uh, the beekeeper removes any other pre-existing honey that is in the hive so that it will not be mixed with the incoming nectar. They then put their hives in a location and at a time when there will be primarily a single main source of nectar in bloom. And then once that honey flow is over, the boxes of honey are removed and extracted. The honey is kept separate from other sources of honey. Well, how do we know if uh, honey is primarily from a single nectar source? Well, for one, by trusting the beekeeper from whom it was purchased. Uh, knowing the beekeeper does matter. Uh, if you're buying honey, though, from a supplier that you don't know very well, uh, then, you know, you need to know there's a lot of honey being sold, labeled as something that it might not be something or might not be a very good example of something. And that's when sensory analysis comes in. You know, the honey should look, taste, and smell like the honey that, that you're buying. You know, if if you're buying a, an orange blossom honey and it's dark like molasses, that's that's kind of, that's not what you expect. And even, maybe it was uh, something else or maybe the honey was overheated or burned. Um, and the same thing is true with taste and smell. If you're a, a commercial honey supplier, you might want something more than trusting the beekeeper or tasting and smelling the honey. And that's when laboratory analysis can come in to help uh, clarify, you know, is this truly a honey from the botanical source that it's supposed to be? And then finally, there's the classic technique, melissopalynology. Basically, the honey specimen is prepared, the pollen is spun down, and then it is looked at under a microscope to determine what are the main sources of pollen, uh, the main, main flowers that the bees have gone to uh, in order to harvest that and produce that honey. And in general, to be considered a monofloral honey, the frequency of primary pollen must be 45% or more from that source. Uh, now, there are exceptions, however. This rule is not set in stone. Some honeys are what we call underrepresented in pollen. Examples are citrus, lavender, alfalfa, and dandelion. On the other hand, some honeys are what we call overrepresented. Chestnut is a classic example. You could have a chestnut that would be 50 or 60 percent pollen, chestnut pollen, but because chestnut castanea is, is um, overrepresented pollen in honey, it needs to really be more than 85 or even 90 percent to be considered monofloral. So this is a long list of the honeys that I will be discussing. I'm going to pause and talk here on this slide for a bit so y'all can get a, a look at all these different honeys. I, you know, I, this is a long presentation and I don't expect that you want to go through and listen to each and every one from start to finish. Uh, rather, if there's one variety that you're interested in, then skip ahead to that. Normally, when I give this presentation, I hide all the slides of all the honey varietals that I'm not going to talk about. And then the honey samples that I brought, you know, six to eight of them, um, I'll have those slides so that we can go into more detail, talking about them maybe five minutes or ten minutes or more about, you know, what type of flavor profile we're getting. Uh, I, by necessity, th these discussions and descriptions are going to be short because, you know, obviously I can't spend five minutes on each one. That would be a never-ending presentation. 
Originally, this presentation was going to be directed towards mead makers and mead judges so they could have a better idea of how to use that honey, and then so mead judges can have a better idea of what to expect when they're judging a mead, a traditional mead made from that honey, but I decided to broaden it. So I've included some varieties of honey that are too expensive or too rare that, you know, I never would expect someone to make mead out of them, but they're interesting honeys nonetheless. I've tried all of these honeys except about two or three of them, and I was going to leave those 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 few out, uh, but I thought I'd, I'd better include them because they're interesting enough or unique enough that I think they're important to keep in this presentation. Uh, there's also a handout that you can print out. Uh, there's a link on the YouTube uh, on the YouTube ch uh, page where this uh, is. So if you want to download that and print it out, and then you can get a list of these different honeys. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is, you know, my sensory description my impression may be quite different than yours and that doesn't mean that one of us is wrong or not you know perhaps my sample was different than yours perhaps you have different uh, sense of perception than I do uh, and that's perfectly fine that's why when we taste honeys we often like to do it with you know more than one person it makes it more fun more interesting and plus different you know sense of taste will pick up different things that maybe I might not have noticed or others might not have noticed and with that, let's get this presentation uh, moving along. Angico. This is a tree in the legume family, and like a lot of plants and trees in the legume family, it's one which honeybees like to work for, for pollen and nectar. Uh, sometimes it's called Brazilian acacia, and although it's related to that, it's not exactly the, the same thing as acacia. It's The honey is light colored to golden in color. Taste is tropical fruit notes fruity floral aroma lingering tropical finish uh, the, the tree is interesting in that the hardwood is resistant to rotten termites which as you might imagine in a tropical location that might be something important uh, when you're building with wood alfalfa also called lucerne in some places it's a crop widely planted for livestock forage and hay the honey is mild light water what it's white to extra light and amber in appearance a floral aroma sometimes with notes of beeswax this honey is or this plant is interesting in that it's pollinated by the snap trigger mechanism uh, when the pollinator when the bee lands uh, there's a snap trigger which hits the bee in the head transferring the pollen now honeybees don't like this so usually by the second or third time of working these flowers they learn to avoid the snap trigger and collect the nectar without actually uh, getting the pollen uh, that's why there's very little pollen in alfalfa honey and that's why honeybees are not the best pollinators for alfalfa. Now, to grow alfalfa hay, you don't need to pollinate your field, but if you, you know, as a farmer rancher, but if you're a grower of alfalfa seed to send, you know, to, to sell to farmers and ranchers who are going to plant alfalfa fields, uh, then it's important for those flowers to be pollinated. Some seed growers will use other types of bees that were evolved to pollinate the alfalfa flower, such as the alfalfa leaf cutter and others. others. Uh, another way is to simply have a large number of honeybee colonies pollinating because the younger foragers have not yet learned and there will be some pollination going on, just not as efficiently, you know, bee per bee visit. Almond blossom. Almonds originated in Iran and the surrounding region are now planted widely, but in the U.S. they're pl primarily planted in the Central Valley of California. It's important for commercial beekeepers. 50 to 80% of uh, commercial beehives are in the U.S. in February to March, pollinating the almonds so that they will produce. Uh, pr produce. The honey is not often harvested. For one, it's important for the bees, but it's a unique honey in that it has a bitter taste, sometimes with stone fruit, dried fruit, and a nutty finish. And some people don't like this honey because it has a bitter taste. Myself, I think it's unique, and, and you know I think every honey has a place. Uh, so if you're able to get a, a sample of it, certainly I encourage you to try it. Apples are, are fruit trees that originated uh, in Central Asia, interestingly where some of the subspecies of honeybee originated, and they co-evolved, so the honeybee is the pollinator of apples, and in order to promote uh, apple production, the growers must have uh, colonies of honeybees there to pollinate. The honey is light golden brown with a floral aroma, reminiscent of how the apple blossoms smell uh, when they're in bloom. Aroeira. Uh, this is a, 
a, a plant in the cashew family. Uh, the honey is a wonderful complex honey. It's dark with a brownish red hue. Uh, the taste is complex with dried fruit, cotton candy, marshmallow, warm spices. Uh, it's not to be confused with another plant, the Brazilian pimp, pink peppercorn, which is another species altogether, which is sometimes also called Aurora. And then there's the aster. When I was a young beekeeper, new to beekeeping way back when uh, on, on the East Coast, uh, aster honey was one of the late honey sources that would come in the fall. And it's a wonderful honey if you can get enough of it. The thing that's intriguing and unique about this is it, it produces a strong odor while ripening. Uh, and this has been known about for ne many decades. And the odor is so strong, sometimes some new beekeepers think that there's something wrong with their hives or, or maybe the hive has foul brood. Now, many beekeepers attribute that stink to goldenrod, which blooms at the same time as aster, but it turns out that's not true, and they've, we've known about this for over 100 years. Now, myself, as a new young beekeeper, I figured this out on my own. I went out into the field where the goldenrod was blooming, and it had a, a smell and aroma, but nothing related to the, you know, similar to the stink of the ripening honey. But then the aster plant blooming right nearby that the bees were also working, I smelled those flowers, and they de definitely had a stinky aroma. It's been described in many different ways. Uh, some describe it as stinky socks or stinky cheese. Uh, sometimes sickening or sour odor. And unfortunately though, it's been become such conventional wisdom that the, the stinky ripening honey is goldenrod that, you know, good luck trying to convince other beekeepers that it's not actually the goldenrod, even though we've known for years it actually isn't. Um, I've seen on social media other beekeepers try to explain that actually it's the aster honey, um, and they get shouted down, as is often the case on social media. Uh, so I don't even bother to, to even try to explain that. Um, but at least you heard it here. So, you know, if somebody's saying that the goldenrod honey is... is uh, has a foul odor when ripening, they're, they're probably mean the aster honey that's also being ripened at the same time. Avocado. Uh, th these are interesting plants in that the flowers of one sex bloom in the morning, close in the middle of the day, and the opposite sex bloom in the afternoon, but different varieties of avocado will have different sexes blooming at different times of the day. So if you're an avocado farmer, you'll need to make sure that you have the right strains of avocado blooming in proximity with each other so that they'll be able to be pollinated by the bees. Uh, the honey is a wonderful dark honey, rich, buttery, dark molasses, notes of dark chocolate. Uh, the plant's originally from Mexico and Guatemala and has a very large seed pit, as we most of us know who've ever, uh, you know, eaten an avocado or made guacamole from avocados. The theory is that perhaps that pit was dispersed by the now extinct Ice Age megafauna, the giant, giant sloth, which would eat the whole fruit whole and then poop out the seed somewhere else where it could be dispersed. Basswood honey, also called linden or even lime tree in Europe. Uh, these are used as shade trees. It's a light colored honey. The flavor has been described as herbal to medicinal. I find I've, I've had different examples of each. Uh, I'm not sure why some types of basswood lean more towards the minty, whereas others are more towards the camphor and medicinal. Uh, I personally really like this honey, but it is a strongly flavored honey that is not for everyone. Uh, the pollen is underrepresented in the honey. So if you do a pollen analysis, and the amount of pollen is, is more than 10%, this actually may be a monofloral honey, despite not being the higher amount, you know, greater than 45% that we use for generally, you know, for those that those honeys that are normally represented in pollen. Black locust, also called acacia, false acacia. It's originally from uh, the eastern and southeastern U.S., but it's been widely planted elsewhere. Indeed, most of the commercial suppliers of this honey are located in Eastern Europe. The flowers are so fragrant. I remember as a young beekeeper uh, out east, I would go out into the grove of black locust that was uh, loudly buzzing with my bees working the flowers, and I could just smell the wonderful jasmine scent. It's a relatively quick bloom, only for a couple of weeks, so you have to be ready to be able to harvest that honey. The honey is light colored, sometimes lemonish, white or yellow green, hint of vanilla, floral, a wonderful, d delightful honey. 
The wood is rot resistant. I remember pulling fence posts that were 50 years old or more and they had not rotted. It's a legume related to the honey locust, but interestingly, the honey locust is actually not utilized as a nectar source by honeybees, so it's sort of misnamed. The honey locust is a favorite of other pollinators, like bumblebees, for example, but it's not really typically utilized by uh, honeybees, unlike the black locust. Blueberry. Well, most of us are familiar with blueberries. In order to produce fruit, they require insect pollinators. Uh, now, bumblebees are the natural pollinator of, of blueberries, but if you have a large field of blueberries, you're growing blueberries commercially, uh, unfortunately, then th there's just not enough bumblebees to pollinate all these flowers, so the beekeepers bring in hives uh, to help pollinate. The honey is a light to medium amber, buttery rich taste with a berry-like tangy finish, but it's not like the berries themselves. Uh, this is one of the only commercially available fruits that was originally native to North America. The Brazilian pepper tree, another uh, plant in the cashew or sumac family. It's also known as the Christmas berry tree. Uh, the honey is medium amber with a rich mild taste. Uh, some describe notes of plum or fig or sweet potato. Personally, I do not get, have not gotten sweet potato like notes uh, from the, when I tried this honey. I was leaning more towards the fruit, fruity like notes. Uh, the, the fruits, the droops can be dried and used as pimp, pink peppercorns, but they're not actually in the peppercorn family. The sap can cause skin reactions, as can contact with the leaves, similar to other plants within the cashew sumac family, including poison ivy and poison sumac. Buckwheat. Buckwheat, sometimes some beekeepers and some honey uh, customers get confused about buckwheat. There's actually two different kinds, eastern or common buckwheat and western buckwheat. It's important to know the species because that'll affect what, what actually the honey is like. So the eastern quote-unquote buckwheat, Phagopyrum esculentum, has a dark and earthy honey like blackstrap molasses with funky notes, barnyard and horse sweat. It's one of those love it or hated honeys. Uh, some people really like this honey, and myself, I like it. I, I especially like it for making mead. It's not a honey that I would use on my tea or my toast because of the strong flavor. Now, some folks get confused and think the differences in buckwheat is based on where it is grown rather than the, the species. One time I was at a shop and they, they had buckwheat that was being sold as western buckwheat, or I, I asked them and they said, oh, it's definitely western. It was produced in Washington state. And I said, well, no, that doesn't matter. You know, I need to know the species. And, you know, I tried it and it was definitely the funky eastern buckwheat. And I, I told them that and they, they were arguing, oh, no, no, this is from Washington state. And they they didn't couldn't understand the fact that it's the species that matters not the place that it was grown. The funkiness of the honey comes from isovaleric acid and other compounds, which interestingly are the same compounds that produce the funkiness in beer from uh, uh, Brettanomyces yeast and, and some of these other microbes. Now, Western buckwheat is a perennial in the area. It's a number of species in the Eriogonum uh, uh, genus. The honey is also medium dark amber, rich, earthy, sweet. It's a lovely honey, but it does not have any of the funkiness of the common or eastern buckwheat. So if you're going to get buckwheat honey, it's very important that you distinguish between these two, because if you don't want that funkiness, uh, you're going to you know, be unhappy if you get a, a eastern buckwheat that was uh, sold as a western buckwheat because it was grown in the west, even though it's phagopyrum. Cactus blossom. This honey is produced in the U.S. Southwest from saguaro and other cacti. Uh, it's often not a monofloral honey, but a polyfloral blend. There's often other flowers in bloom like mesquite, palo verde, and others. Uh, the honey is variable due to the variable floral sources, sometimes tropical and floral notes with a hint of warm spice. California buckeye. I've tried this honey. It's a red amber color, caramel, multi flavor. It's actually a quite good honey. What's interesting about this is that the nectar and pollen are actually toxic to the honeybees. Uh, that's why the beekeepers, you know, if there's a location that has a lot of this, the beekeepers are going to try to keep their hives not located there because of the toxicity that can actually harm the honeybees and the colonies. Uh, but if it happens to be uh, harvested, the honey itself is actually safe to eat. 
Uh, the indigenous people, the Native Americans, used the seeds, nuts, to stun fish in streams. So they would basically put this in the streams and kind of mash them up, and the fish stunned would float up, and they could be much easier to catch. It just basically pick them up out of the stream. Canola, a type of rapeseed, is a is was is grown for its seeds that are used for the oil, and the rapeseed cultivars that were not selected for this would have erucic acid, which is toxic, whereas canola does not have that. It's a very light honey, a yellow, a mild, buttery, savory, creamy, savory taste, creamy in texture. It's one of the fastest honeys to crystallize due to the high glucose content. That makes it difficult for the beekeepers because if they leave the supers in the hive for too long, uh, that might end up, they might crystallize in the comb and then good luck getting that extracted. Carrot blossom. So seed growers who produce carrot seed for sale to farmers or gardeners need to have those flowers pollinated and they have, use honeymees for that. Uh, the honey is medium dark, earthy, uh, kind of reminds me of, of the root, but not really the, the carrot itself. Sometimes it has an aroma reminiscent of dark chocolate. Chestnut. It's, grown, it's a tree grown for its nuts over in Europe. This is a very unique honey. I, I really like it. Some people don't because of the, the relatively strong taste, wood-like aroma, uh, sometimes slightly bitter uh, finish. Uh, personally, I really like this honey. It's unique in that it's one of the most overrepresented uh, pollen in monofloral honey, uh, usually 90% or more in order to be considered a monofloral honey. Chicory is a member of the daisy or aster family, beautiful blue flowers in the summertime. Uh, the honey is medium yellow amber with a greenish tint when crystallized. It, it tastes like caramel. Some people describe chicory or coffee notes, which I haven't quite gotten myself when I try this. Uh, the, all parts of the plant are edible. Uh, the roots were dried and added to you to extend coffee or to be used as a caffeine replacement for coffee during times when coffee may be in short supply, look, such as during the Great Depression or during the World Wars. There's a lot of misconception about clover honey. You know, what's so, sold in big box stores and grocery stores as quote unquote clover is often not clover, but just a, a mix of whatever light colored honeys are available. It might include alfalfa, might include clover and others. There's also some confusion between this type of clover and then the sweet clover, which I'll discuss uh, in another later on in this presentation. We're talking about the trifolium clover, which are the little pom-poms that we see. The most common is Trifolium repens, which is the white Dutch clover. It's a perennial low-growing clover we often see in our lawns uh, or in pastures. There are other types of Trifolium as well, cr uh, crimson clover and red clover. The honey tends to be light, often water white. It's delicate, sweet, and floral, but it doesn't have the, the cinnamon spice that we get with the sweet clover. coconut blossom honey, not to be confused with coconut nectar, which is sometimes also sold. When I was first exposed to this, I was, I was very skeptical because coconut trees are wind pollinated, or so I thought, and wind pollinated plants have no reason to produce nectar, and therefore they, they cannot produce honey. Uh, as it would turn out, coconuts, interestingly, are both wind as well as insect pollinated. It kind of makes sense, you know, if you're a coconut tree on an on a island in the middle Pacific, maybe there's not enough flies or bees there to pollinate you, and, and perhaps wind pollination may be the way to go. Whereas if you're on the mainland, there's plenty of insects, and so maybe it's useful for the insects to pollinate. The honey was light, yellow, buttery, floral, uh, kind of like honeysuckle. Uh, don't confuse, uh, you know, coconut blossom honey, which is relatively hard to find, with coconut nectar uh, or with honey that has been infused with coconut flavor. So true coconut blossom is is a little bit more difficult to find and make sure if you're, you know, what you, you know what you're getting. Coffee blossom, and you know, in order to pr uh, produce the fruit that eventually is made into the coffee, the flowers need to be pollinated. Uh, the nectar contains trace amounts of caffeine, which is thought to stimulate memory in honeybees, so they will return to the flowers. You know, that can be advantageous. If you're a little flower that's blooming and there's a lot of other flowers, if you can convince the bees to search out this 
this nectar so that that'll result in more effective uh, pollination and i know that you know i want my cup of coffee in the morning and so definitely the caffeine will attract me to have that cup of beverage to consume in the morning versus something else the honey is medium to dark amber caffeine ca- uh, caramel toffee flavor earthy spice a nice complex uh honey coriander also known as cilantro uh, some people, you know, obviously they, they, they think the leaves are quite offensive because they have a, a genetic uh, variant that causes them to have a soapy taste. Well, the honey does not have that soapy taste. So even if you don't like the cilantro as a herb, uh, the honey itself does not have any of that flavor. It's medium, golden, amber, savory, earthy with warm spices. Very complex. It's even, it's difficult to describe, in, you know, in, in words, all the complexity of this honey. Sometimes with a tart, crisp finish, sometimes described as citrus. Cotton is a group of plants in the mallow family grown for fiber. What's interestingly interesting is cotton was independently domesticated in both the new and the old world. You know, more commonly, if a plant is domesticated for human use, it comes from, you know, either the new or old world and then is introduced elsewhere. It's also interesting in that this is one of the plants that has what they call extra floral nectaries. So most nectar is produced in the flower as an attractant to attract bees to the flower and other pollinators to the flower so that they will also move pollen around and help pollinate the flowers. But cotton has nectar producing uh, organs in other parts of the plant, such as on the stem at the base of the leaves. Uh, you know, you might wonder, well, why do they want to produce nectar at a places away from the flower? And the thought is perhaps they might be able to attract other insects, such as ants. And if the ants are walking around on the stems and the leaves looking for this nectar, they also might be cruising around looking for any type of pests that uh, and try to keep them off of the plant. So it might be beneficial for the plant. The honey is light to medium gold, buttery in flavor, like like butterscotch. cranberry uh, and related to the other to the other berry the lingonberry uh, these are low creeping shrubs grown for their berries uh, the honey is medium amber with a reddish tint it has a tangy taste not quite the tartness of the berries themselves uh, and it's related to blueberries and huckleberries now the with the berries themselves are used to make mead or wine the berry, and this is, does not apply to the honey, but to the berries or the berry juice, uh, sometimes you can get a stuck fermentation because of the presence of benzoic acid. Sodium benzoate is a preservative that's used in many foods and beverages, and benzoic acid occurs naturally within the berries. So if you're going to make a mead or wine using cranberries, you might be best to add them after alcoholic fermentation is done in order to avoid any suppression of the yeast activity. Again, this does not apply to the cranberry blossom honey, but it's a little interesting bit of trivia about the berries themselves when you you might be thinking about making them, in, them into mead or into wine. Dandelion, a, a perennial weed introduced to North America from Europe. Uh, most of us are well familiar with these yellow flowers that occur in spring and sometimes into the summer in cool, moist climates. This is in the top 10 favorite honeys of mine. It's creamy yellow with a unique pungent, earthy, musty floral aroma, similar to how the flowers smell. Uh, some people don't like this honey because of that pungent earthiness, but it, it reminds me so much of those flowers and brings me back to the child, my childhood when I would pick those flowers that I really, really enjoy it, uh, and I enjoy uh, it just eating it straight or making it into a mead. When you're making a dandelion wine or mead out of the flowers themselves, you want to make sure that you use only the yellow parts because their parts will add a, a bitterness. The dandelion blossom it's, itself, the dandelion blossom honey itself is rarely harvested because it's such an important first nectar source for bees in the spring. Uh, but if you have access to this, uh, you know, it is a really delightful honey and I, I really recommend uh, trying to get a sample of this if you can track it down or if you can produce it uh, as a beekeeper. Eucalyptus is a very large family of, of hundreds of species of trees and shrubs. The honey is most often produced in Australia, South Africa, and Brazil, uh, maybe a little bit over uh, in California, other places. The honey is variable because there's so many different species of uh, eucalyptus. Uh, I look forward to the day that I get to travel to Australia so I can try some of these honeys that we simply don't have access to here up in the U.S., 
Uh, it can range from being light to more dark. It can be bold flavored, sometimes with butterscotch or menthol finish. Fireweed. It's a perennial growing in the northern hemisphere. It commonly shows up in disturbed grounds such as after a forest fire. And there are places where you can have acres upon acres of, of just straight uh, fireweed, you know, after there was a, a forest fire. It's most commonly produced in the Pacific Northwest or up in Alaska. The honey is water white to light amber, delicate, mildly sweet, uh, notes of tree fruit. I, I detect toasted pear and other flavors like that. Gallberry, two species of holly that are found in the coastal areas of the United States. The honey is a medium amber. It's thick and heavy in texture and mouthfeel. The taste is rich and fruity with a molasses finish and it's relatively slow to crystallize. Some consider it a less, a less expensive substitute for Tupelo, um, but I'll let you be the judge of that. Huayio. It's a plant in the legume family, nitrogen fixing, and like other legumes, the bees like to work these flowers. The honey is light to golden amber. Taste is light and mild, sweet floral, sometimes lavender-like, sometimes with a spice or hint of smokiness. It's often grazed by livestock, but if it's overconsumed, it can lead to poisoning. Uh, there's excitatory uh, neuroactive amines, including tyramine, that if that's all the livestock have available can actually be harmful for them. Goldenrod, a honey that's familiar with many of us, especially those in eastern North America, it typically blooms in the late summer to fall, and it's one of the last honeys to be produced. The honey is medium amber to dark. The taste is butterscotch with hints of licorice or anise. A lot of beekeepers say that when this honey is ripening, it has a stinky aroma, but as we already already covered in the aster honey, the, the, the aroma probably is coming from the aster uh, nectar that's being harvested and brought into the hives at the same time. Uh, but many beekeepers are strongly convinced that it's the goldenrod honey that's causing this uh, smell. Uh, so good luck uh, trying to convince them otherwise. Hawaiian Kaiawe. This is a mesquite native to South America, but it was introduced to Hawaii for preventing erosion, to replace forest, and unfortunately now it has become an invasive species, crowding out many native species. Uh, the bees like to work this flower, and it, it is a great light white honey, soft and creamy. The flavor is described as light and tropical, sometimes with menthol, although I have not gotten the menthol uh, character myself when I've tried this varietal. Hawaiian Lahua is probably also in the top 10 favorite honey varietals. Uh, these are bright red pom-poms, sometimes other uh, colorful colors. The honey is creamy, smooth in texture, uh, flavors of butterscotch, tropical fruit, delicate uh, floral aroma. It's one of the few honey plants in Hawaii that is native to Hawaii. Heather. There's two general types of heather. There's the scotch or ling heather, Coluna vulgaris. Uh, it's a very complex honey. It's Every time I taste it, I pick up more tasting notes that, that are difficult to put into words. The honey ranges from red orange to dark amber. Flavor can be bitter, tangy, pungent, smoky, mildly sweet, warm floral, fresh fruit aroma. Uh, it's slow to crystallize and often has a high moisture content. What's unique about this honey, it's one of the few thixotropic honeys. So a thixotropic honey is gelatinous rather than liquid, and it will not flow like liquid honey would, uh, but it has to be harvested with special techniques. Unlike floral honeys, where the cappings can be uh, taken off and then the honey can be spun down in an extractor, heather uh, honey will not flow. It has to be stirred or vibrated. It's a relatively expensive honey, hard to find in many places, uh, but if you ever have access to this and ever have a, the ability to try it, I strongly recommend that you try this type of honey. Now there are other types of heather. Uh, sometimes these are called winter or spring heather. Uh, there's multiple species in the genus Erica. 
Uh, the honey is variable due to there being a number of species. The color can range from amber to dark. It's fragrant, pungent, spicy, woody, minty, caramel, persistent aftertaste. And unlike uh, the Kaluna honey, this honey is not thixotropic, so it can be harvested with usual techniques. Honeydew is a, a group of honeys that are made from uh, secretions of insects feeding on the sap of trees. Uh, most commonly aphids, but other insects too, scale insects, mealybugs, leafhoppers. Uh, the honeybees gather this secretion and then make it into a honey. It can be quite variable depending on the source, but it's usually dark, rich, woody, astringent, sometimes often like molasses. It's also called forest honey, pine honey, oak honey, uh, it tends to be less sweet, less acidic, higher in mineral content, less likely to crystallize than traditional floral honey. In the U.S., we have a honeydew honey made uh, from secretions of the sugarcane aphid that fed on the sorghum plant. And it's it's very similar to the sorghum, uh, you know, like the sorghum molasses that you can sometimes get. It's a, a really lovely honey. Japanese knotweed, sometimes called a bamboo honey. Uh, this is a species related to buckwheat, uh, but it's an invasive species, unfortunately. Uh, like many invasive species, though, because it came from Europe or Asia, it's uh, preferred by honeybees because that's originally where they came from as well. The honey is dark, often with a reddish hue. It's very similar to buckwheat. It's dark and earthy and nutty, but it does not have the funkiness of eastern buckwheat. Uh, but despite the nickname bamboo, it has no relation to true bamboo, which is a grass, and you know a grass would not produce nectar. The reason why it's uh, called bamboo is because it grows in thick stands, replacing many other types of plants, and the stalks are uh, hollow, kind of like bamboo in a way, and that's where it gets that name. Kudzu, an invasive plant uh, which has taken over much of the southeast U.S., I, this is one of the honeys that I have not yet tried, um, but I'm, I'm including it because it's very unique. The honey is often purple when it's produced in some locations, such as eastern North Carolina. The flavor is reported to be fruity, like the flowers, like grape Kool-Aid or grape jam. Uh, the cause of the purple fl the color is not determined, maybe due to the pH or the aluminum of the soil. Uh, I would love to get a sample of this honey, not only to taste it, but to look at it under the microscope, to look at the the pollen, you know, to confirm that it is truly from kudzu and what the, uh, you know, what the percentage is. Uh, you know, kudzu grows all over the southeast U.S., and the question is, why does purple honey not occur in many other places? And nobody really knows that. Maybe in other places, kudzu is not, you know, utilized by the bees as much, or maybe the chemistry of the soil is different. Um, but nobody really knows why this honey is purple in some locations, uh, and it's not found in other locations. <clears throat> Lavender, a wonderful herb that's found in landscaping and also in our herb gardens. Uh, it's a The lavender is used as an essential oil. The honey itself is white to light amber. It's aromatic, sometimes with a hint of the lavender flower. Lingering finish, slow to crystallize. Uh, some species have camphor-like notes. Uh, the pollen is underrepresented in the honey. Leatherwood is probably one of the most unique honeys that I've ever tasted. I remember the first time uh, I tried this, I was just very surprised and impressed with this honey. Uh, it's, it, you know, these, these words and descriptions really do not do it justice uh, given how complex it is. It's a dark amber honey, aromatic, floral, musky, spicy, uh, caramel, vanilla, woody, a long lingering aftertaste. Uh, it's not commonly available here in the U.S. You really have to seek it out. Uh, it's produced in Tasmania and uh, Australia. Lychee blossom honey. It's a tropical evergreen from Asia. Uh, the honey is yellow to light amber. It's, it's a floral honey, jasmine and rose-like notes, light and buttery, with uh, fruity tropical fruit and lychee notes. 
Uh, lychee seeds and also the underripe fruit have a compound which can cause low blood sugar in those who are undernourished, especially children. Uh, but if they uh, eat something, so they're not like fasting uh, before they eat the underripe lychee, then it apparently doesn't happen. And this has been a problem that's been reported in India and some other countries where there's malnourishment and then the, they're, the kids are eating a uh, lychee fruit that are uh, under um, underripe. Macadamia blossom. Uh, these trees were native to Australia, but two of them produce edible nuts, and they've been planted widely. Uh, and here in the U.S. in Hawaii, it's a, a, it's a type of honey that is harvested. The honey is dark amber, sweet, buttery, caramel, nutty, chocolate. Uh, Mangrove is a group of different species of shrub or tree that grow in salty or brackish uh, water, usually around shorelines. Uh, the honey is variable, but the main honey producing species is the black mangrove, which grows in Florida, Mexico, and other places. Uh, the honey can, is light in flavor with complex caramel aftertaste, sometimes with salty, smoky notes. There are other species of mangroves that occasionally produce honey as well that can be more dark or strong in flavor. Manuka honey. Uh, this is a honey that's been shown to have antimicrobial effects. It's actually a, a delicious honey, kind of strong in flavor, thick, viscous, earthy, herbaceous, aromatic, sometimes with a mineral and slight bitter, bitter finish. Maple trees are, are one of the first sources of nectar and pollen in the northern hemisphere. This honey is not harvested very frequently because the bees need any incoming nectar to replace the stores after the long winter. Uh, but if you can get access to this honey, it's light amber, sometimes with uh, a tart citrus notes. Some people describe a hint of maple flavor. I've not gotten that. Maybe it, I, I just have a different... Uh, perception or maybe the samples of maple that I've had are different. Um, it can have a lingering buttery or creamy uh, finish. Uh, don't confuse this with honey that was infused with maple flavor or maple syrup. That's not the same thing. We're talking about honey that was made from nectar collected from the maple blossoms. Marmeliero. Uh, those of us that have a background in in house plants or uh, other you know other types of plants, we will recognize croton as a a genus of plants that are often grown as house plants. Uh, this, these this group of species are growing in the arid regions of northeastern Brazil. The honey is straw to yellow gold color, floral fluorude aroma with a citrus, sometimes like orange peel or tangerine, uh, sometimes with uh, warm spices like cloves. It's called Brazilian quince, but it's not to be confused with the common quince tree that originated in Europe that we grow for the fruit. They're completely different plants, completely different uh, types of plants. Many people say meadow foam honey is their absolute favorite honey that they've ever had. It's a very distinctive, unique honey. Uh, it's produced by a small plant growing in moist habitats in California and Oregon planted in reasonable amounts or reasonable or, or limited acreage. Uh, it's grown for the oil which is used primarily in commercial and cosmetic reasons. The honey is medium dark with a strong flavor and aroma of roasted toasted marshmallow and vanilla. And if you've ever tried this honey you'll never forget it. It really is a, a, a very one-of-a-kind type honey and it's I would put that in, in my top 10 favorite honey varietals that I've ever had. Mesquite is a, a number of species that grow in both North and South America. In the U.S., it's produced in Texas and in the Southwest. Because there are multiple different species, the honey can be variable from light to amber. Uh, the flavors and aromas can be, you know, hint of fruit, sometimes with an earthy aftertaste, long finish, thick texture. It's not like the mesquite, like, you know, the wood that you use, you know, the, the, smoky, the smoking barbecue or anything like that. It's not quite like that. The Hawaiian kawaii actually happens to be a type of mesquite that was introduced to Hawaii from South America and now unfortunately is invasive. Mint blossom. Mint is a type of herb that's grown for essential oil, culinary use. It also grows wild. 
it's the honey can be quite variable due to different types of species of, of mint uh, the flavor can also be variable most of the types that I've had have been more floral but some types can have a hint of menthol or camphor one type of mint called bee balm is rarely utilized as a nectar source of, for honeybees because the the flower tubes are too long for the honeybees to be able to reach it's primarily used by bumblebees uh, butterflies hummingbirds and other uh, pollinators but not so much by honeybees mustard is an important source of pollen and nectar for honeybees it's related to canola which is why it's one of the more rapidly crystallizing uh, honeys uh, the honey is white to light amber the flavor is spicy and pungent with caramel and earthy finish Orange Blossom, one of the classic varietal honeys that many people are familiar with, at least when they first become familiar with the fact that there's different types of honey. Uh, the honey, it, it's just really unique. It's, it's, it basically smells and tastes like the citrus orchard in bloom. Strong floral aroma like orange blossoms. Uh, are, often this type of honey is used to describe all citrus honeys, whether they're mono or polyfloral. Uh, sometimes, if you're lucky, you can find other types of monofloral honey, such as lemon blossom, which was very similar to orange blossom when I tried it, but it did have some more lemon notes uh, than I would say compared to the orange blossom honey. And there can be differences in orange blossom honey, you know, if it was from Florida versus California versus Mexico. Uh, so I definitely recommend that try not only orange blossom, but try different sources of orange blossom from different places to see what type of differences you might be able to detect. Phacelia is a, a group of plants in the borage family. They're commonly planted as a wildflower seed blend or, you know, for a pollinator-friendly garden. It has a long bloom time. Uh, the bees love it. If you have any of this blooming nearby, the bees will absolutely love this, uh, this flower. The honey is pale to amber, sometimes with a tint of light green or reddish brown. The flavor is sweet, sharp, tart, herbal finish, sometimes with notes of citrus. The pomegranate uh, fruit comes from a shrub, and it's actually the seeds of the fruits that we eat for the for the the juice and the and the flavor. Uh, the honey is amber to mahogany. The flavor is smooth to sweet, with some red fruit or red berry notes. Pumpkin, and in this I, I would also include squash. It's it's really impossible to distinguish between uh, honey produced, you know, from uh, pumpkin versus squash. It's a medium to dark amber with a beautiful orange hue. The flavor is sweet with notes of the squash or pumpkin, but not the not the pumpkin spice like you might have, you know, your pumpkin spice flavor in your coffee, not that. The interesting thing is the, the, the these plants were evolved to be pollinated exclusively by the squash bee. Other types of bees, such as bumblebees, if they use the, the pollen, it can actually be harmful and decrease the, uh, the, pol the population. So they try to collect the nectar only. It might be possible that the, the honeybees might be affected in this way too. Now, of course, if you are a pumpkin grower, you want to produce lots of well-developed pumpkins, you do need to have some bees around to pollinate it. And if you don't have enough squash bees for your large field, you might have to have a beekeeper bring in some honeybees. Now, usually it's not really a problem that's really been anybody's actually talked about because typically there's a lot of other things blooming around the area and so the honeybees are not only utilizing the pumpkin as their sole pollen source. Radish is an edible root vegetable and if you're growing radish for seed to sell the seed to farmers or gardeners you will need to have insects to pollinate it. Uh, if there's a, enough uh, of a radish field present the bees can sometimes produce a honey. Uh, which is light amber, sweet light, dry aftertaste, quick to crystallize. Honeybees love raspberries. We have a large raspberry patch, and whenever it's in bloom, it's a buzz with our honeybees and other pollinators, other bees. Uh, the, the, the honey is light amber. It has a floral aroma with a fruity taste. And in this case, it is reminiscent of the raspberry. You know, other berry honeys like blueberry and cranberry are not quite as reminiscent of the fruit, but this one is a little bit uh, more similar to it than I would say. Uh, the berry is actually a cluster of little fruits called druplets. Uh, so each 
uh, Drupalit has one seed, and every raspberry is a collection of 100 to 120 of these. Rhododendron honey, sometimes called mad honey. Now, I don't recommend that you eat this or that you make mead out of it because of its toxic effects. Uh, those who have tried it uh, report it to be reddish amber, bitter taste with a long finish. Um, I've looked at, I've had a sample of this, which I was able to do a palynologic analysis of it, but I didn't really want to experience the uh, effects of the toxic toxin. Uh, it can cause nausea, vomiting, neurologic changes, changes in consciousness, and hallucinations. Historically, there's many legends about how this honey was utilized. Uh, for example, when there was an invading Persian army, the Greeks uh, set out uh, some of this honey. The Persian soldiers ate the honey and were incapacitated, allowing the much smaller Greek army to come in and basically, uh, basically slaughter them, saving their, you know, saving their uh, town or country or whatnot. And there's other reports of this having been done. It is collected for some people who seek this honey out, uh, Turkey and Nepal are the main places. Uh, knowing the effects of this, uh, it's not something that I really would want to try myself, and I, I'm not really would recommend that for anybody else either. But I've included this because this is one of the you know monofloral varieties of honey in the world that you know, is kind of interesting for for what it is. Rosemary is a herb that many of us are familiar with. You know, we use it as a herb for flavoring. It's also used in landscaping in warmer Mediterranean type climates. The honey is light in color with a mild flavor, subtle flavor, sometimes with wood, woody, herbaceous notes. Most of the monofloral honey, rosemary honey, is produced in places like France, Italy, Portugal, and Spain. Saffle flower is grown for its uh, seeds, which are used to produce saffle flower oil. Because the honey is dark and strongly flavored, it's not commonly harvested. Some people don't like this honey because of its strong taste. Uh, myself, I like all honeys, even the ones that have strong flavors. Uh, it's a unique honey, and the bees love the flowers. They're an excellent source of both nectar and pollen. Sage. Uh, there's a, a couple of different types of sage. Uh, the black button or black sage, Salvia mellifera, uh, grows in the central Californian coast and into the Sierra Nevada mountains. It doesn't produce honey every year. The, the conditions, rainfall and whatnot, need to be just right, so maybe only three or four years out of every decade. The flavor is more complex than the white sage honey that's more common. It's light in color, but the flavor is earthy, savory, often with a hint of spice, such as black pepper. Uh, and the name, Salvia mellifera, you know, means honey producing, mellifera, uh, which tells you how what a wonderful honey plant this can be in the years that it is blooming. The other common sage type of honey is the white sage, Salvia apiana. Not to be confused with sagebrush that grows extensively throughout the western U.S. Sagebrush is a wind-pollinated plant, and thus it does not produce nectar, whereas sage in the salvia family does. Uh, the honey is white to water white, a light, delicate floral honey that's slow to crystallize. And then there's purple sage, not as common as the other two. It's a light honey with a floral taste. It's commonly planted uh, for drought-tolerant xeriscaping and landscaping. It, it grows in multiple places, but uh, most commonly uh, in Southern California. Sainfoin, it's a legume that's planted uh, as forage or a hay crop. I really love this crop, but unfortunately it's not planted quite as much as say alfalfa is. Unlike clover or alfalfa, it does not cause bloat in cattle and other ruminants, which is a benefit. Uh, the honey is a white to very light amber, smooth honey, smooth in texture, delicate fruity floral aroma. It's a wonderful honey. Uh, the the St. Foin isn't planted quite as much as alfalfa because it doesn't tend to regrow for second and third cutting hay. But the benefit is that it's very long lived. Once it's established, it can live for decades. And it's not quite as dependent on moisture, you know, whereas alfalfa might require some irrigation in order to produce a sufficient amount of hay. Saw palm palmetto, sometimes called palmetto for short, is a palm found in the southeast U.S. and Florida. 
Uh, the honey is light, deep amber, full-bodied, bold, smoky, caramel, sometimes with woody and citrus notes. It's a, Even though these are not very large plants, they're extremely long-lived, up to 500 or 700 years. Cider. I had the privilege of tasting this honey one time at a, a beekeeping conference, and there was some gentlemen from the Middle East. I don't know if they were from Saudi Arabia or from one of the Gulf states. Uh, their English was not very good, and I didn't even know exactly what I was tasting. I had to write down the name, and then I had to look it up afterwards. It was a medium dark amber honey. The flavor was medium sweet earthy with a mild bitter aftertaste. Uh, and supposedly, they said this was one of the most luxurious, most rare, most expensive honeys in the world. It's known as the Manuka of the Middle East due to antioxidant and antimicrobial properties. Snowberry, species of shrubs in the honeysuckle family. Uh, the honey is golden in color, floral, honeysuckle-like aroma, spice, stone fruit, vanilla, toffee, butterscotch. Uh, the white fruits are eaten and enjoyed by birds, but are mildly toxic to humans. Now, where I live, we have snowberry growing, but the bees don't seem to produce any honey from it. I'm not sure why, if it's the wrong species, or perhaps there's enough other floral sources growing at the, or blooming at the same time that the bees just kind of ignore it. I would love to be able to produce some of this honey, but at least where I'm located, it doesn't seem to be something the bees are that much interested in. Sourwood honey. This is one of the most coveted honeys in the southwest, or southeast, in the southeast. Uh, it's native to the mountainous areas of southeastern uh, North America, the Appalachians. Uh, the honey is extra light to light amber. The flavor is anise, black licorice, caramel, spice. It's sweet, a slight astringent in the finish, and it's slow to crystallize. Uh, the leaves and branches are tart, which is where the name comes from. Uh, the sourness comes from the presence of oxalic acid. Unfortunately, because this is a honey that's in such high demand, there's many examples that are being sold, you know, at farmer's market and roadside that maybe is not quite as much sourwood as it should be, but the general public often doesn't know any better, and they'll pay a premium, you know, for it to be quote-unquote sourwood honey, uh, you know, even when it maybe isn't. So basically let the buyer beware, and if you're going to buy sourwood honey, make sure you taste it first so that you know what you're getting. Spanish needle. A few years back, I had the privilege of collaborating with a commercial mead maker to make a mead, and they had this brilliant golden bright yellow honey. It was a bright like butter, and it was thick, delicate flavor, maybe a hint of citrus. And at first, we didn't know what it was, but it turned out it was Spanish needle. The genus name is Bidens, which has nothing to do with uh, uh, the U.S. president. The name comes from by, uh, meaning two, and then dens, meaning teeth. And that's because the seeds have two teeth, which allows them to stick to clothing or fur of animals, uh, which can be very annoying. And in some places, it's considered an invasive weed. However, uh, in some locations, the bees seem to like it, and they produce a wonderful bright yellow honey. Star thistle. There are two types of star thistle, purple star thistle and then yellow star thistle. The purple star thistle tends to be produced uh, more so uh, in the eastern U.S., the upper Midwest. The honey is light to medium in color. Flavor is mild with a hint of anise, lingering aftertaste. Uh, sometimes you can get spice, cinnamon, molasses, and almond notes. The species name Kelsotrepa comes from the world Keltrops, which if you look at the flower bud, you see those spikes there just like a Keltrop. And then there's yellow star thistle. This tends to be produced more so in the western U.S. and especially in California. The honey is mild, sweet like candy. The color is yellowish green, sometimes with a fluorescent note. Uh, it, it's somewhat less complex than the purple star thistle, but it's still a wonderful uh, honey in its own right. Strawberry tree. This was one of the more unique honeys that the, the times that I've had a chance to try it. Uh, it's a very unique honey, and some people really are turned off because it is, it's quite bitter. The color is dark amber to light brown. It's pungent, strong complex, bitter f uh, flavor, bitter aftertaste. Uh, 
you know, myself, I think every honey has a place. Uh, I think it would be wonderful to try to make a mead out of this honey. Uh, it probably is not something that I would put on my toast. Uh, the common name comes from the fruits looking like strawberries. The edib they're edible, uh, but this plant is not actually related to the true strawberry. Sunflower, of course. Uh, these uh, are plants from Central and North America that have now been planted uh, around the world for their seeds. The honey is light to yellow white, creamy, light floral aroma with a nutty flavor. It's called sunflower because the flower itself looks like a sun, but also because of heliotropism. The younger flowers follow the sun throughout the day, so they're pointing to the east in the morning, overhead at noon, and then towards the west by sunset. Sweet clover, melilotus. This is our main honey crop out here in South Dakota. We don't get it every year, unfortunately, because the conditions have to be quite uh, just right. It's a biennial, which means the seeds sprout one year and then bloom the second year. The color is a light amber, and it's got a distinctive aroma flavor of cinnamon and vanilla. Uh, the flavor comes from chemical compounds called coumarin. Uh, this is interesting. It's the same compound uh, that is found in tonka beans, cinnamon, cassia, uh, sweetgrass that give the cinnamon taste and aroma. But in the 1920s and 30s in Wisconsin and other places, there were uh, dairy cows dying from a hemorrhagic uh, illness. They did not know the cause of which. It was later discovered that the, it was from sweet clover hay that had gone moldy, and the coumarin was converted by the by the mold into dicoumarin, which is a blunt thinning agent. It's used in rat poison. And this is how later on they discovered coumadin, which is a blood thinner used for medicinal purposes. And that's that, 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 that led to the development of all these anticoagulants. Now, we don't have to worry about this in the honey, of course. Now, out here on the Great Plains, we don't get sweet clover years every year. But if everything is just right, if you have the, the opportunity of visiting out here during a sweet clover year, you're going to be amazed by the horizon to horizon blooming of sweet clover as far as you can see. And you can smell that sweet cinnamon, vanilla, and hay-like uh, aroma when it's in bloom. You know, us beekeepers out here on the Great Plains live for those sweet clover years, but they only occur every few years when there's a moist enough year the first year for the seeds to bloom, and then another moist year the following year for the plants to grow and, 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 uh, and bloom. Tallow tree. It's originally from China. It's unfortunately invasive, but like a lot of other invasive species, the bees really like to work the flowers. The name comes from the oily seeds that were used for candle and soap making. Uh, the honey is a medium amber with rich, slightly bitter, full-bodied caramel flavor and hint of spice and cinnamon. Thyme. It's an herb native to the Mediterranean and introduced elsewhere. You know, it's used as a herb for, for cooking and it's planted for landscaping. The honey's color is light amber to amber. It's strongly aromatic with a taste like resin, medicinal, herbal, savory, sometimes a reminiscent of uh, tropical fruits, dates, even white pepper. Most of the commercial thyme honey is produced in the Mediterranean with some from New Zealand where it was introduced. Toyon is a, a plant growing in extreme southwest Oregon and California coast down to Baja. Uh, it's a medium amber honey that is smoky and nutty, reminiscent of smoked or roasted hazelnuts. The common name is Chris Christmas berry, but it should not be confused with the unrelated Christmas berry tree, also known as Brazilian pepper tree, uh, which is a totally different uh, plant, totally different species, unrelated. Tulip tree, it's, it's a very large tree, one of the largest trees in the eastern North American woodlands. Uh, I, when I was a young beekeeper out east, uh, my bees certainly made some of this honey. The color is dark, red amber, rich complex, uh, dark fruit, cherries, sometimes with a smoky or buttery finish. Another common name is tulip poplar, but it does not have any relationship with the true poplars, the cottonwoods, the aspen, and other poplars. Tupelo. Uh, this is another uh, fairly well-known honey that's, uh, you know, that's unique and, and people will pay a premium for. Uh, the color of the honey is light, sometimes with a greenish hue. Flavor is uh, like pear, cotton candy, buttery, sometimes with a touch of cinnamon. 
It does not usually crystallize. If it does so, it does so very slowly. But if, if the honey crystallizes easily, then of course this question, is this even Tupelo at all? Uh, it, it's actually relatively difficult for the beekeepers to harvest because the bloom time is short, only two to three weeks. And they grow in wet places. So the, the hives have to be put on stands so they're protected from flooding or on some type of boat or barge during the time that the trees are in bloom. Omo was a, another complex, unique honey that it's difficult to describe in words uh, when I tried it. It's medium in body, creamy texture, strong floral, strong fruity notes with uh, almond, vanilla, anise, cloves, and caramel. Uh, it's almost difficult to, to put all the description into words in a very short description like I have right there. It's reported to have antimicrobial properties, even more so than manuka honey. Vetch, specifically hairy vetch, is a legume that's grown as a cover crop for, for forage or hay. The color is light, flavored danil, uh, has vanilla, toffee, and caramel. Uh, sometimes it can become a weed because it recedes itself readily. That might be a problem. For example, if you planted vetch in a field for a cover crop one year and the next year you want to plant wheat, you might have some of them, some volunteers regrowing and resprouting, which you might not want. And then that brings us to Yopon, which is uh, another uh, another uh, tree or shrub in the holly family. The color of the honey is dark amber, bold flavor, vegetal, herbal, and earthy notes, sometimes a slightly bitter finish. Uh, it tends to be produced in the southeastern U.S., and it's one of only two plants native to North America that produce caffeine. The species name Vomitoria came supposedly from Europeans uh, witnessing indigenous ceremonies where the plant was ingested and then vomiting occurred afterwards. Finally, we have wildflower. Now, I know W comes before Y in the alphabet, but I, I uh, you know, forgive me, I decided to put uh, wildflower at the end. I know this is a presentation about monofloral honeys, but I think any discussion about honey varietals cannot, uh, you know, cannot go on without at least mentioning wildflower. You know, there's many types of wildflower, as there are beekeepers and places where beekeepers keep bees. Unfortunately, wildflower does not get the respect that many of the monofloral honeys do. And I think that's a shame. You know, when we talk about, say, uh, types of wine, we talk about terroir. That's everything about where those grapes were grown, the year they were grown, the location, the weather, the soil, the climate conditions. And when we also think of wine, many of the great wines of the world are actually blends. They're not a single, you know, type of grape as, as many of the wines here that are grown in the New World are. Wildflower honey is kind of like that. Uh, and so I really think it should not be undervalued or underrated. There's many types of wildflower. Here's just some examples. You know, the spring wildflower in the U.S. tends to be a lighter colored honey, lighter flavored due to there being trifolium, clover, apple, and the other trees. Whereas in the same location, uh, often the fall wildflower is darker and str sometimes stronger flavored due to the other floral resources that are being used. Desert wildflower in the southwestern U.S. is another one. Often it's primarily mesquite, but there's Palo Verde, Cat's Claw, and others. I've had some wonderful Hawaiian wildflowers. One of my favorite was predominantly Lahua, and it was a great value because I was able to get that honey that was primarily like Lahua without spending the higher money that it would have been had I gotten a monoflora Lahua. I've had delightful Brazilian wildflower honey as well, which is variable depending on the location, time of year that it was harvested. And then finally, I had some uh, Zambian forest wildflower honey from Africa that was dark, richly flavored. It had notes of brown sugar, uh, molasses, treacle, dried fruit, and cigar smoke. Some of you may wonder where I sourced some of these honeys. Uh, here's a list of some honey suppliers I've used. There's many others that I've gotten honey from, but these are ones that I've used. Or if I haven't used myself, I have tried some of their honey uh, that others, that uh, friends of mine and acquaintances of mine I know have purchased honey from them, and then I was able to ha uh, try some of those uh, honeys that they had, uh, had sourced. Another resource to find honey suppliers is the National Honey Board. You can look up your own state and see what type of beekeepers and honey suppliers are located in your 
a region or area. Now, if you're interested in learning more, there are resources available online. If you're interested in becoming a mead judge or just simply learning about honey uh, and using it in mead, there's the beer judge certification resources for mead makers. Ava Crane has a great classic book uh, from 1975. If you can uh, get a copy of that, it's definitely well worth it. Honey Traveler is a website. They tend to talk more about uh, European honeys and, and then also some from, the, from North America. Uh, and then there's some books and then also some articles where you can also uh, read about the various types of monofloral honeys and nectar producing plants. Well, that brings us to the end of this very long presentation. Uh, thank you for uh, listening through this. I, I hope that you might be able to acquire some of these monofloral honeys and then taste them for yourself and come up with your own ideas and thoughts on how you uh, believe that they taste. Uh, honey tasting is a, is a fun thing to do with others. I, I recommend doing it with your beekeeping club or your home brewing club or just with friends and family. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you so much for watching our series of videos.